welcome to another edition of The Pedal Shift Project. The Pedal Shift Project is a series of conversations, thoughts, and experiments around the bike touring lifestyle, from tips and tricks to ideas on how to ride your ride. Let's shrink the world by bike. Show notes and more are available at pedalshift.net slash 139, and you can email the show, pedalshift at pedalshift.net, or call the voicemail hotline 202-930-1109, and check Pedal Shift out on all the socials as well. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the 139th edition of the Pedal Shift Project. I am Tim Mooney, back again. I am so excited to share this show with you, uh, as I just spent a lot of time with my dogs. This episode, we're going to talk about dealing with loose dogs when you're on bike tour. This is a topic that comes up time and time again, and I'm finally getting around to doing an entire show on it. I think that it's something that is a your mileage may vary kind of thing, depending on your relationship with dogs and the nature of what dog is um, coming at you while you're on a bike. So we'll talk more about that later on in the show. Wanted to open things up as usual with a little bit of follow-up on past shows and some connections with folks as well. As I mentioned, I'm back from a long, long road trip to Oklahoma. Uh, I drove straight there and straight back. Uh, usually, we always say, uh, Kimberly and I, my my uh, lovely partner, Kim- Kimberly, uh, this is where she's from and we're visiting her family. Uh, we usually say, oh, yeah, 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 we'll split up the driving. Here's the thing. I'm a terrible car passenger. I am the worst. I, I, I get I get car sick real easily, uh, motion sickness real easily. Of course, I've talked about that on past episodes of the podcast when I've been on boats. I am a landlubber. I am I am a terrible passenger. Uh, this trip was really interesting. We were originally going to plan on splitting up the drive, but then lo and behold, I got what I think was food poisoning on the way out. And so I drove the 20 hours plus breaks uh, drive all myself because I found when I was not uh, driving, I was worse. So picture this sleep deprived, <laughs> completely nauseous. And the only thing you can do is keep driving. It was the worst thing ever, but I also did it on the way back without food poisoning. It was much better. That said, I'm a tired, tired person right now. It's amazing. The difference between, uh, riding a bike all day and driving in a car all day. It, I feel almost as, I feel almost more tired having driven in a car. Of course, I got a lot less sleep too. But in any event, Oklahoma was fun. There was a, a, a it, it, it looks like a fun state to bike in, although it's not super bicycle friendly. It's also so wide open. It's beautiful. I would love to do it. There are parts of the state that I would really uh, wouldn't mind doing at least some kind of a bike tour, the Wichita Mountains in particular. I think that would be a really interesting place to do it. But it's there's not a lot of infrastructure except in the cities uh, and the small cities in particular. Interestingly enough, the one thing that I saw that was kind of a huh, how about that was a ton of e-scooters in Norman, Oklahoma, which, of course, is the home of the, uh, the University of Oklahoma or OU, as they they call it there. Um, and so it was kind of it was it was really interesting to see the changes uh, that are slowly happening even out in that direction. But I don't know. Um, Oklahoma doesn't have a lot of bike touring routes that go through it. But I'm intrigued with it as a possibility someday, maybe, uh, to do a couple of days in the Sooner State. It's a beautiful place. Um, heard a lot of from a lot of folks over the last few weeks, and I thought I would play a little bit of catch up on that. Um, one thing that I, I would love for you to encourage more of, and I promise I will actually play these on the show, is call the voicemail hotline if you're out and about. Uh, as I mentioned, 202-930-1109. Would love to hear more kind of audio postcards. I think I'm stealing that line from the folks at the Sprocket podcast, but uh, that that would be really fun to hear from you while you're out and about. But um, let's see, what do we got here? We heard from George, who is cycling from Budapest, or I believe I'm supposed to say as a worldly person, Budapest, but I can't do that because it sounds weird to me. I don't know why. I think that's the actual pronunciation though, but Budapest uh, through the Greek islands. He looks like he's having a fabulous time. George, thanks for writing in. Also heard from John who uh, gave a kind of a, a ride update going through. He was trying to do the length of the CNO starting in DC, ended up running into the washout uh, that I've talked about and done the video on. But he ended up doing the road detour. Now, he didn't say why. It might have been because the water levels were too high but uh, to get around the washout. But he did the road detour around there, and he did it in the dark. I mean, talk about, like, degree of difficulty here. He was describing it as 10 to 12% grades, tons of curves. He did it in the dark. So he did it, like, you know, dancing, dancing backwards with one arm tied around his back kind of a thing. Uh, but he managed to get through. Despite having to call the ride early, though, he, he, he had a really... Uh, good time. It looked like uh, he's back in Atlanta 
And uh, the one thing I'm hearing, though, is despite all the difficulties that John had, the uh, trail is starting to dry out in parts. We uh, uh, Triple P, Preston Page Piper, a friend of the show, has been out and about. There are definitely some awful muddy spots still, especially where the, the river has flooded over the CNO trail. But elsewhere, it's really starting to dry out a lot better. So I would expect where I ran into problems a few weeks ago, that that's probably a much better go of it right now, which is really, really nice. So who knows? I'm hoping to do a little bit of the of the CNO in November, but we'll have to end up seeing how well things go. More of that, of course, in a few weeks when we do the preview episode for my November ride. Let's see, who else did I hear from? Heard from Randall, and uh, he he wrote in actually several weeks ago, and I've been meaning to mention this. He uh, sent me some information on Amtrak, and as you may remember, this was kind of a minor detail for my Katy Trail ride back in the spring. I ended up going from uh, Kansas City to the St. Louis area, and then I took a train back to Kansas City because, to my the best of my knowledge at the time, there was no bike service, rollerboard bike service from St. Louis to Chicago. I would have much preferred to have just taken a train from Kirkwood to St. Louis and then gone back home that way. But instead, I had to go all the way back to Kansas City and all of that. Well, Randall ended up showing me that, yes, indeed, there is rollerboard bike service from trains in in St. Louis going to Chicago. I went, uh, went online and confirmed that as well. So I don't know whether I just missed it completely back in May or if Amtrak finally added and completed that service availability. In any event, you don't have to go all the way back to Kansas City anymore if you are taking the train. That was really cool. So Randall, thanks for uh, mentioning that. Um, that that makes things more likely for me to consider trying that again, because that's a lot of extra travel that I did by train that I didn't need to. So I may consider doing the KD again, and I may consider doing it with uh, the train setup again. I still have a bunch of points left over, so might might, might try doing that again next year. I really enjoyed that ride, really enjoyed Missouri. So, uh, Randall, thanks for pointing that out. Speaking of the Katy Trail, if you remember from my ride in May, I ran into a couple of guys from Michigan. Well, one of them, uh, they had mentioned at the time that they were going to be doing the Great Allegheny Passage later in the year. They did it. They uh, sent me uh, some notes on the whole thing, and uh, they had a great time. They did run into the issue that I've talked about on the Gap. Ohio Pile is such a great place to stop. It's beautiful. It's a state park. It's picturesque. They do have a campsite that caters to the bikers. The problem is, is it's up a really, 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 really steep incline to get up there. And I've actually never stayed there myself, but everybody I've ever talked to said, yeah, it's there and I'll never do it again. So I told them that because they were planning on staying in Ohio Pile. I would love to stay in Ohio Pile myself, but I've never done it. There was talk that they were going to actually have a more primitive hiker biker set up. Uh, down at the trail level, and nothing has come about of it as far as I know, which is too bad. But anyways, they they wrote in, uh, one of the guys wrote in and said, hey, Michigan guys here, and said, uh, yeah, it was kind of a tough incline situation. But they actually ended up meeting somebody who helped them out and drove them down the hill so that they could uh, get a bite to eat down in town and not have to go up and down that huge, huge long, I think it's like almost a mile long and really steep trail to get up there. Really hard to push your bike up from all reports. Um, I'm hoping that maybe the state park will consider putting in a primitive campsite there at some point. That would be that would be nice, even if it was a little further away from town, because I'm sure that's one of the considerations that they have. They just don't want people driving in and walking into it. I don't know. It would be great to have. It would be a great resource for cyclists on the gap. But um, what they have for now is what they have. That is how it is. Uh, one last thing in terms of all of the follow-up, I wanted to mention we've got a new member of the Pedal Shift Society, and that is Byron Patterson. I've noticed that uh, I, I when I mention the new folks, it's always at the end of the show, and I think I'm going to change that. I think I'm going to mention all the new folks in the middle of the show so that they get a little bit of recognition. Thank you, Byron, for becoming a member of the Pedal Shift Society. If you don't know about it, if you fast forward through the ending credits, that's fine. You that is that is what you can do. You can do that. But um, it is a way to support the show. A couple bucks a month. You can do one shot if you'd like. That's all at pedalshow.net slash society. It's a great way to kind of kind of keep the lights on around here because there are costs to doing the show, like hosting and all that other kind of stuff. So uh, if you like what you're hearing, go ahead and go to pedal shift. Pedal sh- I'm going to try that again. Go to pedalshift.net slash society and do like Byron did and sign up. He uh, he signed up at a monthly level. So thank you so much, everyone, for uh, being a part of the society and helping to support the show. Uh, as I said, if you like what you hear, go on over there and check it out.
Next up on the show is The Lab, and The Lab is a portion of a show where we talk about experiments and kind of dealing with things, hacks, tricks, tips, kind of like what we did last episode, uh, you know, and this episode, it's a little bit different than most labs. Uh, most of them tend to be hacks you do on your bike and things like that. These are more ideas and experiments and um, tips on how to deal with loose dogs on tour. This is an issue that I think I run into more often than I ever anticipated. I think that there are, at least in the States, and certainly in some countries globally, this is an issue that a lot of bicycle tourists will run into. It's a regional issue here in the United States. I know that, for instance, Kentucky, uh, routes through Kentucky, especially on the Trans Am. It's one area down in the south on the southern tier, some of the deep south states. Uh, I hear things in certain sections of Texas. Uh, Louisiana, I think Mississippi and Alabama to a certain extent as well, you're going to run into folks who ha don't have dogs on leashes. Their properties are in a rural place, so they let their dogs out. And some of these dogs don't care for bicyclists, or they're at least confused by bicyclists going by, and they'll run out and there's confrontations. So this is, I think that this is an area that's about as controversial <laughs> in my mind's eye as the whole helmet debate, do you need to wear a helmet, or the earbud debate, is it cool to have earbuds in when you cycle? Because I think that there are a lot of folks who have a wide, wide range of attitudes towards dogs generally. Then you add on all of this, and you add on the layer that it can sometimes be a safety issue, and I think you get a lot of folks who come to loggerheads on this issue. So I thought I would address this with just some ideas for you. Everyone comes at this from a different perspective. I'll, we work with, when I say we, Kimberly and I work with somebody for Kimberly's clothing business. She is deathly, deathly afraid of dogs. Literally, we can't, we can't even have the pugs, my, our dogs, the little, little teeny cartoon dogs around her. She's so afraid. So I know that there are a lot of folks who have a phobia, and I don't use that word to diminish it, but it, it that are, are so deathly afraid of dogs that this is something that really, really is, it, it terrifies them. So then there are other folks like me who are used to dogs, used to dogs that are a little loud and barky and maybe even a little aggressive. Um, and I sort of roll with the punches a little bit. And you may live somewhere between those poles or you may be right on one of them. But I know that your perspective on dogs has a great deal to do with how you deal with them. Um, also, your experience. Have you ever been attacked by a dog? Have you ever been injured? Have you ever been bitten? I, I can totally understand how that can create an issue for you as well. So generally speaking, take all of this with a grain of salt and, and it, it, you know, Put yourself along the spectrum here. There may be some ideas in here that will help you. There may be some points on this where you just flat out disagree and you are not necessarily in on how I wanted, how I would recommend that you deal with things. So I, I, I recognize that this, like so many things in bike touring, it's, um, there are no necessarily bad answers. Although actually I'm going to say a few things on, uh, some solutions that have been proffered out there on the internets that I just strongly disagree with. So um, we'll talk about this in a second. Anyways, I'm dancing around the issue. Let's jump into it. Dogs are acting on instinct. I recently did a week in uh, Utah uh, for our foundation. We do a lot of work uh, with animal welfare and things like that with our foundation work. And I learned a lot about the how dogs deal with things uh, at this place. It's called Best Friends Animal Sanctuary. You may or may not have heard of it. There's a TV show, apparently. I'd never heard of this, but uh, that followed, I believe, the Michael Vick dogs. Uh, he was involved, of course. Boy, I'm, I have to go into like tangent on tangent here. Uh, Michael Vick was an NFL football player who was involved in uh, some uh, dog fighting circles. And the dogs that he uh, most famously was working with, that's probably a bad way to put it, uh, ended up at this animal sanctuary and they were rough and they were gruff and they were aggressive and these folks really helped them an awful lot. So they deal with dogs that are coming from some bad places. The, the, if you have bad instinct and bad uh, training and things like that, you're going to end up with aggressive dogs. And I think that since dogs operate so much on instinct, how they behave and how they react is going to vary quite a bit. The vast majority of dogs are, as the saying goes, all bark and no bite. So they're more 
about warning and things like that. So when a dog comes up to you on a bicycle and is very aggressive, the majority of times that's as far as it's going to go. The majority of times. Now, that is not necessarily all the time. And how are you going to know? And that's kind of the crux of the issue here. If you are afraid of dogs, my words aren't going to overcome that. I've talked about my experience with a, a, a woman who we work with who literally can't even handle being around our cartoonish little pugs. I mean, it is – I see it. I've experienced folks who just can't be around dogs and are, are just deathly afraid. We all have our own experiences with animals, so the, zero judgment on all of that. I wanted to try to have this episode, this section, be about some of the options that you have available to you when you are riding along. And a dog is coming up on you and is being aggressive. And you are afraid of what's going to be happening. So here we go. Some some options for you. Consider stopping. Many, many times dogs are chasing for the sake of chasing because that is a behavioral instinct that's in them, that is hardwired. It's in their DNA. It's just how it is. Consider stopping. Once they've caught up to you, a lot of these dogs are just going to stop. They're going to, because, okay, they've caught you, that's it, game over, and then they turn around and go away. That's not going to always be the case, so I understand why you may be reticent to try to do that. Um, if, if you do stop and you feel nervous, which is a totally understandable thing, one of the recommendations that I have read about and I have actually practiced myself in some areas of West Virginia, at least one area, I ride through, there is one dog and he is very aggressive and he always comes up on me. And once or twice I have stopped, I've hopped off the bike and I've kept the bike between myself and that dog. The dog doesn't go around. The dog doesn't try to attack. The dog does keep barking though and is on the other side of the bike. So I just continue rolling, walking, and then I hop on the bike and go. That's one of the things that you can kind of handle or, or deal with in handling it. It's probably... Not always the most preferable thing because of what's happening. You're stopping. You're staying in the situation. And I can understand why that might not necessarily feel real good. Although I will, I'm here to say that sometimes that is all that you need to do. That's all that will happen. The dog will get bored, turn around and go back home. Um, especially if you hop off the bike and just keep walking away. Um, removing yourself from the scenario, of course, is the number one thing that you want to do. Um, if you're wanting to do it a little bit faster, one of these other things, uh, one of these other recommendations may come towards you. Um, if stopping is either not possible or frankly, you just don't want to something I also understand. So uh, let's talk about some things with, uh, we're going to split this up into a few different categories. The first category that I'm going to talk about is non-contact deterrent. So this is exactly what it sounds like. You are not touching the animal, but you are deterring this dog from coming any closer or you're doing something to sort of put a, a break in between their activity and you. Um, the first thing I will say is I'm going to back off from the mic. Loud yelling of negative word commands. I don't know how that'll come across. We'll see how that goes. But yes, literally yelling, no, stop anything along those lines, but doing it forcefully and aggressively. Um, go into the closest thing you can do to a baritone on this. So everybody who's a, more of a high pitched talker, bring your voice down and no stop loud. Um, that's one effective way to do it. It doesn't always work, but it is something that's easy to do and is a non-contact way to deter the activity of the dog. Another uh, thing that you could potentially do, and this, of course, would be something that you would have to purchase or be prepared for ahead of time, and that would be getting an ultra-high frequency device like a Dazer. Um, this is a product that's commercially available out there. It's not the only one. You can look them up if you would like. And they, they're they basically, you know, the old dog whistle thing that we've always heard about back in the day. Um, this is just basically something that's a high frequency thing. It's uh, outside of the range of human hearing, but it's well within the range of dog hearing. I've heard some mixed success stories for people who have had something like that. Uh, might be something for you to consider. Of course, this is something you only want to pull out when you are feeling it in a bad place. Uh, don't do it to dogs that aren't doing anything because it's mean and awful. It'd be like running up to somebody and yelling in their ear. It's kind of a dick move. So don't do that. Um, but that's another possibility that is out there for you as well. So there you go on your non-contact deterrence. Frankly, that would be preferable because you're not touching, you're not getting involved with the animal whatsoever. Next up is non-lethal contact. Um, this is when you are actually coming into some kind of contact with dogs 
that are bothering you. I think that these are the types of things that you'd want to be considering if maybe the non-contact deterrent stuff doesn't work, which is possible. It certainly happens. Number one, your water bottle, believe it or not. Now, for those of you who don't have squeeze water bottles, this is not going to be particularly effective. But if you've got a squeeze water bottle, pull it out and give it a squeeze right at, towards the dog. Now, that is certainly not going to hurt them, but it will surprise them. And often I've heard great, great results out of something like that. The dogs will turn tail and go away because you've just surprised them so much. Um, I think that that's a really good non-lethal contact option for you. And it's, of course, also going to be non-lethal and it won't harm them as well because a little bit of water is never going to hurt these dogs. Next up is pepper spray. And I say this with a bit of a caveat. Be mindful, this is not legal everywhere. Um, There are some states, there are some municipalities, some localities, some counties that are very much against having pepper spray on you. You're going to be traveling. You may be going from a jurisdiction, maybe one that you live in where it's legal and you're going to, could be going to a place where it's not legal. So be mindful of all that. Um, now, if you are using this in a situation where you are really reasonably afraid for your life and there's somehow a cop around the corner and they come and pull you over, I'm here to tell you it would be incredibly unlikely that they would have a problem with you unless you were doing it in a way that was dangerous or not warranted, um, even in jurisdictions where that kind of a thing is illegal because you're using it in self-defense. I am not into pepper spray myself. Um, people have used bear spray as well. That's just a higher volume and a higher concentration of the same stuff. It's basically the chemical that's in hot peppers. So it's not going to be lethal, but it could do, I mean, it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt these animals. I personally don't like hurting animals, so I don't think I would ever use anything like that. But I also come from perspective where I don't have as high fear of dogs and I've had situations where I've run into into stuff and I've used one of these other methods and it's worked out just fine for me. Your mileage may vary. Pepper spray, if that would make you feel better, if you've ever had to use it, if you know how to use it, I no, no, no complaints for me. I think that that's something that's certainly available to you. It certainly works. Um, I'm going to go into the things where, you know me, I never say you're doing it wrong. Uh, for most things, the vast majority of things in bicycle touring. I am going to sit here and get on my high horse and preach here on the following things you should never do when dealing with a loose dog on tour. The first thing I'm going to say don't ever do is don't hit or kick a dog unless you're legitimately being attacked. I have read, especially in some of the Reddit forums and some places where uh, people will talk about, well, all it takes is a good swift kick and the dog goes away. And I I see that as people doing it in the first instance, almost as if they're getting off a little bit on hurting a dog. Now, look, that's just a dick move. I, I, I don't think that you have the right to do that. I don't think that you should do that unless, and here's where my caveat is, if you are legitimately being attacked, if this dog is biting you and that is your last resort, look, you got to defend yourself. I totally understand that. But bear in mind that, you know, that's a risky thing too. Sometimes when you, you know, dogs feel cornered, that may actually make things much, much worse. Also, you're throwing your balance off if you're still riding. There's a whole variety of reasons why this is a bad idea. Oh, by the way, also, sidebar here, uh, let me put the lawyer hat on. Dogs are considered property in these here United States. And if you're, I'm, of course, giving you United States um, law here. Um, So if you are damaging the property of someone else, that actually can get you sued, believe it or not. I know you feel like you're being attacked. It's crazy, but that's the case as well. I just think that doing physical harm to another animal is a bad idea. I think it's a particularly bad idea in all of this with a caveat that if that's your last resort and that's all you can do to get away, then you got to do what you got to do. But please don't just kick a dog because you feel like you can. It's just not cool. Um, Another thing that I read about, and I'm just befuddled. I'm bewildered. I don't understand. People have suggested using bee or wasp spray on dogs because it, it, it it's set so that it can spray a distance and has a distance between you and the dogs. That is the most ridiculous thing I've ever read before. Again, getting on my high horse here, that shit's poison. That's bad. That, that will do physical harm to these animals um, that may just be barking at you. Um, I, I, again, I'm reading from a lot of folks who feel like that because they're riding through and they think a dog is barking at them, they have the license to be able to spray poison on a, on a dog. It's a dick move. Don't do it. It's not good. If you're carrying bee spray because you're afraid of bees and I don't know, you're like a 
I don't know. You're, 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 I don't know why you would be carrying bee, bee poison on you or bee, bee spray or wasp poison or anything like that. Don't do it. Don't spray it at a dog. It's again, a dick move. <laughs> Please don't do it. Um, it may be, it may be effective, but it's not cool. Um, if you really do want to have a spray on you, go back to the pepper sprays, go back to the things I talked about a little bit earlier that that is not poison that will certainly have the same effectiveness. Um, I think that a lot of folks who choose to do this, do it because they're being cheap because for some reason it's cheaper than the pepper spray. Don't do it. It's an awful idea. Here's another one. That, again, I'm, I keep going up. Each of these things get worse and worse for me. So I'm just sort of like, why would people do this? Please don't use a firearm or another projectile weapon like a slingshot or something like that. I can't believe that people have talked about this. Some of you may choose to carry if it's legal to do so where you're riding, but follow your safety training and find an alternative to using your weapon whenever it's possible. Um, it's legal potentially in a whole lot of different jurisdictions. You may, if you're, you're properly licensed, you're properly trained, et cetera, et cetera. It's not illegal for you to carry that firearm when you're going out, out there, but it's probably a bad idea to fire said firearm in this scenario, unless you are legitimately, legitimately fearing for your life. I think that there are better alternatives to discharging your firearm in this scenario. Um, I've gone through a few of them. Number one, consider stopping putting the bike in between you and the dog if that is something that is helpful and continue walking along until you get away from the dog. That is something that has worked for me a lot. Um, just, just continuing pedaling on will work a lot. Uh, there are many instances and I've heard, I, you know, look, I've heard a lot of folks who say, you know, I've been, I was cycling along and they, they, they took bites out of my panniers, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, that's, that, that's possible, but you know, you're getting through there. You're getting out of there. So pedaling through is another good option as well. I mean, that kind of is the first option really when all of a sudden I'm like, do consider stopping and putting the bike between you and the dog. If that is something that you think will work out, um, for you and you are feeling confident in that. If you don't like either of those two options and you need to create a deterrence in some other way with a reminder and a caveat that doing many of these things means you're slowing down or stopping and you're still you're still exposing yourself to the animal number one uh the non-contact i I keep saying number ones there's lots of number ones here the other ones non-contact deterrence loud yelling of negative commands high frequency devices like a dazer or something else that's out there and then going into non-lethal contact like i talked about we're talking your water bottles, going into pepper sprays as necessary, but the things I do not recommend, I can't get behind, don't like these things, don't physically assault these these animals unless you're in legitimate fear for your health or safety, ditto with using a firearm, and don't use poison, don't use beer wasp spray, that's, 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 that's the one that's just, that's just a no-go. So in any event, I hope you don't run into situations like this. It's scary, it's not fun to be... Uh, in a scenario where you're feeling afraid because you've got a dog that's coming after you, but they're operating a lot on instinct, chances are it's it, you're going to get through there without a problem, that it's going to be at most a big scare, and you're going to keep moving, and everything's going to be cool. Every once in a while, you're going to get a situation where you're going to feel like you're legitimately being attacked. The dogs are getting at you. They're getting at, the, at your pannier. Utilize some of these non-lethal deterrents that I've talked about. They do work. They do have effectiveness to them, and very likely you're going to get out of there with just a good story to tell, and then maybe some ideas of your own on how to deal with loose dogs on tour. We like to close out the show with a big thank you to all of the supporters of the Pedal Shift Project through the Pedal Shift Society. If you like what you hear, you can help maintain Pedal Shift as an independent, listener-supported voice while expanding the offerings. We're talking five bucks, two bucks, or even a buck a month helps with the cost of hosting the podcast, the website, and more. And you can do it for a little bit, cancel any time. One-Shot Support's welcome if you're not into the whole small monthly thing, and you can check it all out and join at pedalshift.net slash society on to the society. Ethan George, Kimberly Wilson, Caleb Jenkinson, Cameron Lane, Andrew McGregor, Michael Hart, Keith Nagel, Brock Dittis, Thomas Skadow, Seth Krieger, Marco Lowe, Terrence Manson, Noah Schroer, Harry Telgatis, John Sikorsky, Richard Killian, Chris Barron, Brian Wren, Mark Van Ram, Brad Hepwell, Paul Mulvey, Stuart Bucket, Todd Stutz, Mr. T, Roxy Arning, Nathan Poulton, Harry Hugel, Stephen Dickerson, Vince LaGreco, Ruth Divorcey, Michelle Miller, Matthew Lewis, Michael Baker, Billy Crafton, Paul Culbertson, Scott Culbertson, Matt Perry, Danielle Jepson, 
Cody Florchinger, Tom Beninati, Bobby Rupel, Roy Everett, Greg Braithwaite, John Mayer, William Cairns, Sandy Pizzio, Richard Patch, Mark Messer, Jeff Muster, Seth Pollock, Dave Roll, Joseph Quinn, John Baxter, Susan Brewster, Drew Porter, Brian Patterson, and thank you to all anonymous and past contributors for helping make this show happen. Thank you for joining. You can find Pedal Shift at pedalshift.net for more great bicycle touring content. You can hear the Pedal Shift project through Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast app. Opening music courtesy of Jason Kent off his self-titled album. The track is called America. Check out his band Sunfield's latest release, Mono Mono, wherever cool music is available.